In this lecture, we are going to be looking at chapter 13, The Craft Media. This is a relatively short chapter, um, but it does have an interesting distinction from the other chapters we've looked at. So to start, let's define what are the craft media. Traditionally, your textbook defines craft as work of expert handiwork or craftsmanship done by the maker's own hand with extraordinary skill. However, we're going to see as time goes on, it does not necessarily need to be by the maker's own hand. We are going to see um, areas where craft is actually produced by machines. However, the main thing that tends to separate craft from art is that crafts are primarily made to be used, meaning they have some sort of function, whether it's serving, storage, uh, clothing, and so on. So in this chapter, the main forms of craft media that we are going to look at are ceramics, glass, fiber, metal, and wood. And then we're going to conclude the chapter with a discussion about the difference between art and craft and whether if we think this difference is actually fair or not. All right, so let's first start with ceramics. Ceramics is a general category that is made up of objects that are formed out of clay and then they are hardened by firing or baking in a very hot oven known as a kiln. Usually they are flat and relief-like, think plates, uh, square tiles, or hollow such as pitchers, glasses, and vases. The hollowness is usually for the utility or the purpose of an object. Think of this, you know, a pitcher, a glass, a vase. It's hollow because it's intended to hold something in the hollow area. Often ceramics are painted with a glaze. Um, these usually are powdered minerals that are applied to the object after the first firing. When ceramics are fired a second time, the mineral dissolves and it fuses into a glassy, non-porous coating that seals the clay um, so it makes it waterproof. And this also can be used to produce colors. Now there are three main methods of execution for ceramics. We have the slab construction, coiling, and then what's known as throwing on a potter's wheel. So first, in slab construction, the clay is rolled out flat. Think rather like you're rolling out a pie crust, and then it is shaped by hand. An example of this is uh, Japanese teacups. Next, we have coiling. This is where the clay is rolled out in long, long um, rope-like strands, so they're kind of like snake-likes, and then they're coiled on top of each other. As the potter builds the coils up in a continuous spiral, each strand is smooth and blended into the next. So this elates, eliminates any of the original ropes, and what this does is it gives the pot walls a uniform thickness. Before firing, the pot is burnished or polished to a high gloss. This is usually done with a type of stone. Now coiling, this can be painted with a slip, which is a type of liquid clay. And this method was actually used by Native American cultures. And then the third method is by using the potter's wheel. A potter's wheel is a flat disc that is attached to a flywheel below. The flywheel spins, either it's kicked by the potter themselves or it's, um, you can, we have electric ones now. And this causes the upper disc to turn. A slab of clay, after the air pockets have been removed, and how you actually remove air pockets, is you take your slab of clay and you throw it against a very hard surface a couple of times to get all those air bubbles out. Um, this is then centered on the wheel, and the potter pinches the clay between fingers and thumb, pulling it upward in a round symmetrical shape, making it wider or narrower depending on the form uh, that they are wanting to create. And this technique was actually developed by the Egyptians as early as 4000 BCE. And now you'll see on the clip here, I'm sorry, on the slide here, there is a YouTube clip. What you'll need to do is go to the slides of this presentation and click on this clip. And what this does is it shows you a uh, short uh, demonstration of a potter using the potter's wheel. Now, the textbook talks about three different types of ceramics. The first is what's called earthenware, and this is made of porous clay, and it's fired at low temperatures. It must be glazed if it is going to hold liquid. The next is what's called stoneware, and this is fired at very high temperatures. It is impenetrable to water, and it's commonly used for dinnerware today. And then last, we have what's called porcelain, which is what you see pictured here. 
Porcelain has a smooth textured clay that becomes virtually translucent and extremely glossy in its finish during firing. This is fired at the highest temperatures. And this was actually first made in China during the Tang Dynasty, which was 618 to 906 current century. Um, usually um, porcelain are often painted with very elaborate designs. All right, let's move on to glass. Glass is made by two methods of execution. It's either made by forming the hot liquid glass or by casting it into a mold. Um, your textbook talks about example of a glass bowl, and this is where pieces are placed around the mold, then heated. They then expand and fuse together. Glass is mainly made of, of silica or sand mixed with soda ash. And then we have glass blowing. This developed around the first century BCE, and this is where the artist dips the end of a pipe into molten glass and then blows through the pipe to produce a bubble. Why it is hot, the bubble is shaped and cut. And that's what I have given you on um, the clip here. Again, you'll have to go to the lecture slides to watch this video, but this is a short video showing you the demonstration of glass blowing. Um, glass blowing is also used in the creation of some stained glass windows. All right, next is fiber. Fiber is an interesting one. We usually tend not to think of it as an artistic medium, especially not three-dimensional, but think of it, right? It does fill a three-dimensional shape, whether it's carpet, tapestry, and clothing. It is a very textural medium, meaning we care very much about the texture, and it has become an increasingly favored medium for sculpture, which we'll actually see at the end of the chapter. Um, there are different techniques. The most common is what's called weaving. This is a technique for constructing fabrics by means of interlacing horizontal and vertical threads. So you have what's called the wrap. These are the vertical threads. And then the weft or the woof. These are the horizontal threads. So to weave, what happens, the wrap, the vertical threads, are held taut on a loom or a frame, and then the weft are woven loosely over and under the wrap, and that's going to make your fabric. Um, a tapestry, this is where the weft yarns are of several colors, and the weaver manipulates the colors to make very intricate designs. Um, embroidery is another type of the fiber craft, and this was a traditional fiber craft where the design is made by needlework. Um, and we also have quilting, which is what I have an example of here. In quilting, you have two different layers that are then filled with some sort of filling, and then a stitching and pattern can be used to create a design. All right, next we have metal, which is the most durable of all craft media. Um, metal is often used to make vessels for food and drink, tools for agriculture and building, and weapons for war. The Chinese first developed the bronze casting techniques as early as the 16th century. Um, gold is the easiest to work with. Why? Because it's relatively soft, and it actually cures in an almost, uh, occurs in an almost pure state. Um, other examples, cast iron and, again, bronze. All right, and then the last that we're going to look at is wood. Now, wood has been favored throughout history. Why? Because it's easy to carve, and it's widely available in almost all areas. However, wood as an organic material is extremely fragile. And so because of that, very few wood artifacts have actually survived over um, since ancient times. Think of it. It can be damaged by water, insect, dry rot, all of that. Um, because of this, cedar is actually a favorite wood to be used. Why? Because it's relatively impermeable to weather, um, it resists insects attacks, it is protective, and it has that nice smell. That's why, you know, cedar closets, cedar chests are very popular because they're durable and they will protect what is inside. Um, wood probably, um, the, its biggest use is used for creating furniture. All right, now we're going to switch um, paces, and we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of the craft as versus fine art. So many artists, if you can call their work craft, they're actually going to be um, insulted by this. Why? Because there's been this traditional idea that craft is kind of something that anybody can use. It doesn't have this high artistic um, level to it. However, this distinction between craft and fine art is all, not always that clear. So usually remember, think of it this way. If it's made to be used, it is a craft. If it's made to be looked at, 
its art. And this distinction actually first started around the Industrial Revolution, and it started in Staffordshire, England in 1759. What happened is Josiah Wedgwood, which Wedgwood Pottery is still around today, he opened up his pottery manufacturing plant. And what happened here is he actually started producing what he considered two different types of pottery. He had what he called as ornamental ware, which as you see on the right here, such as this Pegasus face. This ornamental ware was works that were mainly created to be looked at. They were meant to be more artistic in nature. And then he had a different kind, which he called useful ware. And you see that on the left. This is the Queen's Ware Dinner Service. And he considered this to be more craft, not art. Why? Because it was produced mainly by a machine. Yet we have to think about some of this, right? So this idea that craft, the craft is because it was mass produced, well, the Pegasus vase was also mass produced in a way. Many artists would create this. And so I want you to think about this idea. Right, Both of these actually have a use to it. Right, The Pegasus vase, we can take the top of it and it can actually hold things. Um, and on the left, the Queensware dinner service is meant to be just that. Right, This is a dinner service. We would eat food on it. Yet they both have elements of design to them. Right, Somebody had to design the original uh, Pegasus vase and the Queensware dinner service. So I want you to think about with this distinction, is it really fair? Do you think there is a distinction between craft and art? If yes, why? If no, why not? And do we think this distinction is fair? And this you'll have to address in your discussion board for this week. Now the chapter ends with this interesting uh, project. It's called the Crochet Coral Reef Project. And this was a project that was sponsored by the Institute for Figuring in Los Angeles. And what happens here is they're exploring the aesthetic dimensions of science, mathematics, and the arts. Now this project was founded in 2003 by sisters Margaret Wortham, who is a science writer, and Christine Wortham, who is an artist. And what they were trying to do was to draw attention to the devastation of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. This is where the Great Barrier Reef has died. So it's this project that's made out of fiber, right? It's crocheted, but it's done in a sculptural purpose. So is this more craft or is this more art? So I want you to think about that. And then here is a final clip for you to watch. Um, this is a clip talking about the uh, Crochet Coral Reef Project. So please do look at that.